Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rusty Moyer, uh, the last of the Austin block, uh, talking about my game, Dig Dog. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to, I guess, just start out by showing you guys a trailer of what, uh, what the game is, and then I'll uh, go into a little behind the scenes and go from there. So here's a little uh, preview of what Dig Dog is, which hopefully provides a little context about what the game is that I'm making. That's Dig Dog. <laughs> okay, uh, so Dig Dog is a uh, procedural um, action platformer. Uh, uh, the original inspiration for the game um, was, uh, I guess, uh, three different things. Um, uh, I had been playing a lot of desert golfing at the time, and I was initially looking at trying to do something that was just fun to play, something you could sort of experience and uh, just sort of be in a space without kind of rules. Um, and we'll see where that goes as the development goes on. Um, also, just for the longest time, I've just been in love with a silhouette style, uh, mostly just Limbo. Um, Limbo did uh, a lot for me even before I was making games. I was just enthralled from the art. Just I couldn't, uh, I, just, I loved the world that they told just with just a few I guess just with black and white, and that was even before I was making games, it just really stuck with me. Um, and I also uh, have played a lot of iOS platformers over the years. Um, I love platformers, but I always um, have my phone with me, and I don't know, I think a lot of people are wanting to stick Mario on iPhones, and I think some games have kind of done it better than other ones. Uh, um, I really liked, uh, um, from the Cave Story developer, uh, they did a thing called um, Hero Blaster, uh, where you were a frog and you kind of jumped through uh, the environments. Uh, um, all these games have something in common, which is they, uh, they have controls uh, down at the bottom of the screen, um, and they don't really use an up and a down, they just use a left and a right, and usually just a jump button and maybe one more. And so they have to um, often be kind of designed with that in mind, where they just have uh, a couple things that they're doing. Um, uh, you know, you can't uh, maybe climb up ladders the way you normally would, but um, they have to kind of think about the hand kind of covering the screen and also just, I guess, working with that. But Mikey Shorts and Sword of Zolan, um, which was really had some great art um, and some goofy sound effects, but I mean, I just loved playing these games on my phone. So I guess I was trying to build something, something like that. Um, this was in, uh, let's see, the summer of last year. Um, during, uh, I think there was actually a, um, a game jam from uh, uh, Wagos Rancheros. They were going out to Marfa to create games out there. And I think the theme was Cosmic Cowboy. And I was like, well, what can I kind of do um, with that? Um, previously, before that game jam, I had done some sketches of this thing called RoboDog. Um, I was thinking about an iOS platformer for a while, and I was trying to think about maybe how to do that. Um, I was thinking this le one on the left here is sort of a vertical space where maybe you're a dog and you're kind of climbing through some mountaintops. And I think I had some silhouette stuff I was interested in. And uh, on the right, you can see the one on the upper right is probably the most, uh, whoops, we jumped slides. This one's probably the most what the end product was kind of like. Um, the bottom one here was sort of like cave digging and I think I was really into Metroid, and I was like, oh, maybe there's a Metroid element or something. But I was, I was sketching this at the time. Um, so the game jam happened, and I got at the whiteboard and just you know, went at it and trying to just think, well, what, what could this be? I don't know. It's, uh, it's RoboDog, but it's at night, and there's stars because there's a, a cosmic element to it. And so I was imagining maybe that there was a, you were a dog, and it would be a, a platformer where you're kind of going through the desert, and you're... Uh, 
I guess you're just exploring that space. You're sort of just there instead of um, maybe having a, a strong goal or something you were, uh, you were going after. Um, it was just a, an experience and something you enjoyed um, playing. Um, so uh, I think I had some of that down there. Yeah, you're just sort of being or, and I, was, I guess I was really interested in a procedurally generated experience too because uh, I like those. I don't know what some of these things mean. Idle, F-bat, I mean, uh, who knows, you know. <laughs> it's shmup Zelda. I think I was probably brainstorming there, you know. Um, so yeah, so an iOS uh, platformer initially, um, uh, procedurally generated environment. And I think some, uh, I was interested in some new tools, which I'll talk about in a little bit later. Um, let's see. Oh, and then, well, I, I did this and it wasn't actually that fun. Um, you were just sort of exploring a space and I, uh, I uncovered at some point, oh, I was trying to find out what, how to make it more like a dog. And I'm like, what does a dog do? How does a dog be in an environment? Well, dogs dig. It's like, oh, well, this is great. I'll have the dog digging. And so that's kind of where the game went from there. I was uh, building procedural levels. And then I was like, well, all right, well, let's, let's start some digging. Um, so uh, this is the, I, I guess a few months in, two or three months in, I had a prototype of uh, this digging action happening. So I'll bring this one up now. I don't think there's any sound effects on this one. So um, I think initially too, I was, this is part of from the game jam. Um, I had these stars that I was kind of building out in the world and you were going to have constellations. Um, and as you kind of walk through the environment, um, I think we'll see them flicker. Let's see if I can get them to go. Yeah, as you walk, they would start to flicker, and as you would walk, it would line up, and constellations would start to form. Uh, that ended up going nowhere, uh, but it was kind of an interesting idea um, until I was like, oh, but digging is great. You can just, like, you're a dog, and you're going to dig, and let's just do some quick digging. And like, oh, wow, I can dig down, and this is great, and like, I love this, and like, it's a digging game for, I don't know, desert walking, it's desert digging, it's a desert digging dog. Uh, and the whole thing went that way. Uh, I was building a few uh, levels by hand at first, just uh, trying to figure out what that would be like and just ripping up the environment here. Um, and the dog spins, because I don't know, it does. Um, so the first three levels or so were just done by hand and the dog uh, is basically looking for a bone on every level. So as it explores, explores the levels, it would dig for bones. Um, this, uh, the initial idea was thinking about like how do you, uh, if you already know the solution, like what should happen? So uh, I guess you, you would play through a level if you were to fail a level, if you were to die, it would reset and take you to a new level. Uh, I ended up throwing that idea away later, but um, yeah, it was just uh, these kind of procedural um, upside down caves that you're kind of digging through. Um, and I guess that's where that was for a bit. Um, this was fine, and I think I enjoyed it, but at some point uh, it started to become a little bit dull. Um, I think because there's just, I mean, just lack of interaction. So um, I then was like, well, maybe it's a dog like. It's a, it's a dog, it's a dog rogue like. Um, I have been playing uh, an enormous amount of Spelunky, um, and uh, I love, uh, I love. I was already building this kind of procedural world, so it seemed like a way to go. Um, although it was kind of pushing away from that initial idea, because I mean, there's usually some kind of a um, a strong goal in a in a roguelike. But I I don't know. I mean, I love action roguelikes, um, and certainly a lot of uh, Downwell and Crypto the Necrodancer, and um, I should say um, FTL, um, which isn't quite an action roguelike, but I mean, because you can pause it, but it still feels like this fast, uh, this fast moving interactive world. So uh, that's what I started uh, exploring. Um, there's uh, two modes. Uh, I'm actually gonna bring up the game so I can actually show you what those are like. So we're going to go into Free Dig. Uh, uh, Free Dig is sort of the the original uh, like expression of this idea, uh, although there's enemies now, and it's sort of a like um, uh, it's sort of an exploration of an environment uh, with like this just the freedom to be able to dig and uh, go through an environment at whatever pace. Um, here I died. Uh, there's no penalties to a game over. You just reset the level. Yeah, 
and uh, it's all kind of built on a seed, so um, every person who plays it is going to play through uh, the same, uh, same set of environments. Uh, it saves your progress, you sort of move on, um, and it, I, it, I guess it's, uh, it's sort of the initial, initial idea of like desert golfing digging uh, just as a... As a as a thing, so yeah, that's uh that's that's what the free dig is. And so it'll save it as I quit out. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the uh, the initial game mode. Um, uh, the main meat, uh, as I pushed over more, is in the coin hunt, which is the uh, the more um, action roguelike thing. So, okay, I should probably explain some of the mechanics. So you are a dog, and of course there's a bark button. And all I have to do to dig is actually just push into some of these bricks and I'm able to dig on them. Enemies are color-coded, so red ones provide parts. Yellow for coins. Oh, treasure. Uh, when I jump in air, I have uh, an ability to dash. So whenever I'm in air and pressing a direction, I can dash. This is great for just tearing through levels. Fingers. Try not to step on this guy. Too spiky. Uh, the bats kind of conceal their uh, identity. So a lot of enemies you can skip to go down the level. Uh, but you definitely want to get the coins and the hearts as you go deeper. So most of the time you have just one hit point. So you're always just about to die. And then that's game over, which is punishing. Uh, there's no pressure uh, to uh, speed through the game right now, um, except for some uh, some of the much much later levels. I was trying to make a, I guess, a roguelike experience where you wouldn't be, I guess, really pressured to push forward. Um, something where you could actually think about your actions before you take them. Thinking like, oh, maybe I want to get away from these guys, and yeah, they're definitely closing in. If I can get to the second world here, I've got to say I love the soundtrack. The, I'm getting some Capcom Ducktales vibes. From yeah, the um, uh, Matthew Grimm, uh, who's a frequent collaborator on um, all of the Retro Game Crunch games, uh, he wrote all the music and does just a fantastic job with kind of. Um, I guess creating like a lighter mood. Um, I was looking for a way to uh, not keep the not keep the game too dark um, because it has this whole um, silhouette style, and I think it could feel real grim real quickly. And I wanted to, I guess, find a way to just elevate it a bit, not just in production quality, but just in uh, just the mood. All right, I'm gonna die here. Yeah. So that is what it looks like. Let me hop out for a sec to the slides. Um, yeah, so Matt made all the music. We worked together on Retro Game Crunch where we made like seven small games. Uh, Matt, me, and Sean Inman. Um, and uh, he's doing some great stuff on this. Uh, uh, the game has been a little bit slow to produce um, uh, because uh, this year I've actually been working on three other projects that I've shipped. Um, so I've been kind of this work. I guess the initial idea was also to make sort of a side project that wasn't uh, just huge in scope, something that uh, uh, would be small enough to ship, um, 
and a lot of fun to work on. But also, for another reason, um, the game is um, all coded by voice. Uh, so while I was working on um, uh, Retro Game Crunch and um, other projects, um, I've developed a very heavy uh, RSI issue. So it's hard for me to uh, type uh, for um, very long periods of time um, without having to take breaks. So I have to uh, mitigate that. Um, exercises and uh, breaks have been the biggest one. Um, but even still, uh, I can tell my hands are deteriorating, and I'm looking for a way to basically make games uh, many years into the future. And so um, I'm working on this kind of system for a few years. Um, there's a Windows program called Dragon Natural Speaking, which is, I think, what some of the Siri stuff is based off of. And there's some hacks on top of that that people have made, um, Natlink and uh, Dragonfly, which are basically Python libraries that people use to uh, modify, uh, modify the code. Um, and that allows me to basically write a, a kind of a, a fake spoken language that I use to uh, speak into the computer, and then that actually writes the code. Um, this has been working for a bit, um, but it's a lot to kind of make up the language, to remember it, and to uh, make a game at the same time. Um, uh, but over time, I have gotten better at it. And uh, with Dig Dog, I was trying to set out from the beginning to be like, okay, well, let's do, the, let's do a game uh, from the ground up. Let's do the whole project. Uh, by voice and see how that goes. Um, uh, this was aided in a big way by this infrared mouse uh, that uh, I found, uh, I think a couple years ago, maybe about a year or two, um, called a Navlink, which is sort of for uh, um, people who really can't use their hands at all. Um, uh, it's uh, an accessibility device, which for me in some ways I kind of am disabled. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Um, so you wear a hat uh, with a little reflector on it and you'll move your head around to move the mouse. And uh, it kind of feels like this. You're like, you know, in the Starship Enterprise or whatever, and you're moving your head around, and you can kind of see what this is like. Um, I think that's just one of the demos they have. Uh, let me show you what it actually looks like. Here's a little demo of me uh, doing some uh, voice coding with this, uh, this kind of setup. It's about, what, like a minute? Yeah. Thick. Camel play music track. Slap, right, steadily music track, space, camel new track, add full header, up, yank, up three, pat, save, snore. Steadily music track, world, select left, cut, undo, one nut, left, pat, Coat, slap, pat, two nut, coat, slap, pat, three nut, coat, slap, pat, four nut, save. So uh, that's basically me using this system. Um, all the words that I say are um, either, I mean, either it's code or it's some kind of, uh, it's kind of a spoken shorthand. So I'll, th I'll say things like uh, camel, this is a function, and it types it out in camel case. Um, uh, it's, uh, you could imagine it'd be pretty hard to dictate to Siri out of the box, but these tools um, and just learning them over time have helped me to be able to build out those pieces. Um, not just the code, but also the art has been built uh, without using my hands too. Um, I've been using the laser tracker uh, to uh, draw the enemies, uh, to draw the world art. Um, and it's... Wake up. Uh, Making it take uh, longer to build, for sure, um, but also it's allowed me to, uh, I guess, do it without straining Shoot. my hands, uh, especially while I'm working on other projects. Um, the, uh, and that's also uh, in part why I uh, chose to stick with the silhouette style. Um, I liked the, how it looked visually, um, but also it was something that I could do um, like with this sort of like project limitation. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess that's uh, that's kind of it. Uh, that's uh, Dig Dog. Um, I'm gonna play a little of the game, and uh, if y'all have some good questions, I've got some good answers. Yeah, do we want to take some questions while you're playing? Does, yeah, that, does that work for you? All right, yeah. great. I will, I will run amok here. 
This is the uh, the hub world here. Uh, as you um, find more of the colored bones, you're able to create warp points and shortcuts for you to be able to start deeper in. Hi, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, did, have you considered putting these uh, accessibility tools into Dig Dog as like a playing device? That's a great question. Uh, so um, I didn't make this game entirely without using my hands. That was uh, uh, from the beginning. I was looking at like how do I uh, how do I even uh, play the game and uh, test it. And uh, the biggest way for me to play a platformer was actually with my hands. It was just really no way. At first, I um, created a system for me to be able to uh, move my head left and right to move the character left and right. And whenever I would, I have a, a mouse foot clicker, and whenever I step on that, it creates the character to jump. But it was really hard to do any complex actions like uh, left, right, jump. So uh, all the play testing is probably the biggest way that I've actually been you know, not using my hands. And it was sort of like a project goal, uh, not something I was trying to um, keep too strictly. Um, uh, as far as like the tools that I'm using, it's really just me on top of like the shoulders of giants. Like it's, um, it's other people, it's uh, Dragon's uh, really great software. It's some um, uh, code that they wrote in 2000 to be able to inject Python into the run loop. And then uh, it's uh, some libraries that have been somewhat abandoned and then somewhat picked up by a community that continues to work on it. Um, so it's mostly just other people's work and uh, following, following in those steps. Um, there's not a lot of voice programming, I think, that happens, um, in part because uh, it's obtuse. Uh, it's not easy to learn. Um, it's taken a lot of dedication for me um, over time uh, to be able to uh, to learn it. Um, but uh, also, I mean, it's, it's not friendly to game developers. That uh, infrared mouse was a, a real big uh, win for me because uh, for a while uh, there really wasn't a way. Like most of these voice programmers, they use um, very uh, old school, traditional programming editors. A lot like uh, uh, Vim and Emacs, and uh, a lot of you know people today. I mean, I, I use a lot of C++, but uh, I know a lot of people use Unity, and uh, you couldn't really imagine using Unity without a mouse. So, um, hopefully, in the future, um, but maybe not. Uh, yeah. So that answers the question for you. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Hey, sorry not to continue distracting away from your work and focusing on your tool set too much, but just to oh, kind yeah. of like Fire away. Yeah, yeah, no, back it's, off it's, that question, like, I'm curious about, like, how much, like, like, are you kind of adding a lot to this accessibility um, for programmers scene? Or, like, do you, do you have some set of dragonese you said that you're crafting that you're kind of opening back up into the community? And do you I think would... that's a contribution that you're making? I would like to. I would like to do something. Uh, it's so I've refined some of my tools as uh, as I've been going um, and learning more about it. Um, uh, I still have I, I I still have a lot to clean up. Um, like you know, by making this uh, this way, um, uh, I've learned a lot about like. Well, I really need to uh, kind of find better ways of um, I, it could become more efficient. Um, I'm actually uh, working on um, at least a blog post or a paper kind of outlining um, all the technical stuff of like what I use and how it works. Um, at least trying to make it um, visible for game developers um, and kind of where they could go to um, pick it up. Um, so that's probably step one. Uh, but also it's, it's been a pretty exhausting thing um, learning how to do this, putting together uh, it's remembering a new language and then trying to use the language to program something makes it take a lot longer. Um, so it's, it, I don't, it's not like it's like, oh, I'm too busy to do that. But like, I do want to get back to, so it's important. So uh, yeah. For what it's worth, I would watch an hour of you like coding that way by voice. <laughs> it was fascinating to see. Super cool. Do you have a question stream. over here? So uh, when I first heard the name, the first thing I thought of was that it, and it seems justified, uh, play on the game Dig Dug. Uh, one of the mechanics in that game 
was digging tunnels strategically to get um, enemies to follow you into traps. And I haven't seen that mechanic yet, but it seems like there might be that in this game. Is that something you've included? Uh, not, not on purpose. Uh, there are some uh, spikes and things you could knock enemies into or lure them on. These, uh, these buzz, actually, these buzz traps are dangerous, so they actually can do that. Actually, yeah, Dig Dug wasn't a strong influence. Uh, I've not really played it. Um, the name was just too good. It was like, well, I'm making a game about digging a, a dog. It's like, this is just, I mean, initially I had like dig a dog a bone and uh, desert dog digger and other weird alliterative things. But uh, once I had the, the title cut out um, um, w uh, out of the tiles, it was like, oh yeah, I gotta call it Dig Dog. So, uh, but kind of like, uh, uh, I mean, the biggest influence, of course, it, with the roguelike elements is Spelunky. I'm a huge Spelunky nut. Um, I think I do want to see more uh, more ways, uh, especially as we get to the later worlds. I should probably cheat and actually just, nope, nope, I don't have a debug build. Um, uh, let's see if I can actually get a little farther and find some ways to trick some of the enemies. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, so there's some ways, yes, but uh, maybe not, uh, maybe not a ton. Uh, James, you had a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, Rusty, two questions uh, about procedural generation. Uh, you mentioned that every player has the same seed. Is that just for the free digging mode, or is that on the coin hunt mode as well? Yeah, that's actually just for the free digging mode. Um, I was trying to make sort of a... I don't know what a shared experience. Um, so level seven is the same for everyone. Uh, with the roguelike stuff, um, none of that's the case. It's all oh shoot. <laughs> uh, the uh, it's all um, uh, yeah, it's all basically you know different every time, and it's different for each player. Okay, and the other question I just had, can you talk a little bit more about the procedural generation? Does it use kind of set pieces like Spelunky does, where it has a number of arrangements that it uses within a level, or is it is it a little more organic than that? How how does the how does the procedural generation work? Yeah, there's a few there's a few layers um, with the uh, sort of like floating floating uh, floating island caves, um, and each of the worlds uh, take on a different aspect of that. The first world here is. Uh, Using a lot of cave generation, um, uh, I think it's called, people call it, uh, if I can remember, is it A-star? I can't quite remember. Um, no, that's the pathfinding. There's, it's, a, it's basically if you search for cave generation, uh, it's like going to be the first kind of thing that comes up. Um, and I basically invert that in the first world. Um, uh, that's kind of where the, the primary base comes from. The second world inverts that and actually creates um, desert caves and kind of goes from there. Um, on top of that, I layer in uh, some um, hand-made uh, elements that are randomized um, with random rooms on top of that. Um, uh, all the, the enemies and the um, props the cactuses, the graves in the second world, um, they're all, uh, they're kind of looking for, uh, just randomly looking for pieces uh, above and below that have accessible points. Um, I think for some of the generation, I look at um, kind of uh, how many uh, caves exist. Um, there's a lot more filled in areas earlier on. Um, as levels go on, uh, I start to add density with uh, more things that can hurt you. Um, Try to keep it uh, easier in the first world. Uh, even though the game is punishing in that it'll kill you, I'm trying to be friendly to players and um, give them a chance to think through actions. Um, you can dig slowly. Just hold down and dig now, and you can just kind of dig carefully um, or quickly if you're in a hurry and you're good. You're like, yeah, no problem. I'll just blow through this. Um, but really not trying to have too many dynamic surprises um, until World 3. Um, so here's like kind of a, this the shop is just sort of a room that, oh, let's see, can we get something? Not quite. Well, if I had a heart, I could steal from the shopkeeper, but I don't have one right now. Let's 
Oop. Oop. Oh, ah, I, I saw what was going to happen just before it happened. Uh, yeah. Uh. Other questions for Rusty? Oh, yep. Okay, so back to the coding with your voice. Um, yeah. So you know how like when you compose a text message by transcribing it with Siri, like you kind of have to think a little bit differently. Uh huh. Like you kind of have to like compose your thoughts a little better in advance or stumble through it and then hand it it later or whatever. As opposed to when you're writing, you're just like, I don't know, I'm just gonna start typing, see what comes out, and make it up as you go. And then coding is also this totally different way of thinking, like where I for sure don't know what the hell I'm, I mean, I'm not the world's best coder, but I don't know what I'm going to code until I start typing. I'm like, while, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, mm -hmm. probably something's got to go in here. Wait a minute, I didn't set up my variables. I'm going to backtrack as an initial, you know, like, you kind of code in this like weird sideways thing. Yeah, So yeah. how the fuck do you put those two together? <laughs> uh, with, I mean, ultimately, it's just with a lot of uh, dedication. I think uh, any, uh, any spoken language, um, when you're trying to think in a different language, which I speak none of, so I don't know what I'm talking talking about um, but you do need to uh, uh, at first you're you have to think about what you're gonna say and then try to say it so at first it's sort of being slow um, but later on you just start to intuit uh, some of the vocabulary stuff um, it just uh, just slowly is what it comes down to yeah it's not been um, I've been working on this process since um, 2003 wait no 2013 um so um on and off for four years and there's definitely been a lot of breaks where i've just been i haven't been able to give it enough focus um uh, but yeah and uh i think yeah i think just coming back to back to it and just kind of staying with it has been like the biggest help um huh. All right, so I've got a question for you. I know you've done in the past a lot of uh, co-op games, multiplayer. Is that something that you thought about with this game? Um, or is there a particular reason you wanted it to be a single player experience? I mean, uh, I iOS is obviously one, yeah, one yeah. issue. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's more like having, it's like one of those like, oh, I have done that. Um, I was looking for maybe more ways of yeah, just it being a, a solo experience um, just because I had done so many of the other ones, uh, so many multiplayer ones. Oh, I think I can actually, I'll skip it and move on to the next one. Um, uh, the, yeah, I've done, I've done enough. Uh, m yeah, I'm yeah, just different. Yeah, different. Single player is good. I like single player. Oh, there's a question away in the back. Oh, no. I'm coming for you. Not too late. George Royer. Hey, Rusty. Hi. I was wondering if, you know, I was looking at thinking about your other work, and, and you do pretty much all the art for your stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but often. Like, so you often have like, this really similar aesthetic, and your titles are usually built around um, the sort of simple but, you know, instantly likable, relatable character like Fox Cat or Big Dog. And I was wondering if you're slowly luring us into like a Rusty Moyer cinematic universe where <laughs> Fox Cat and Dick Dog and all the other you know maybe the pilot from Astro Duel or something are all going to come together and uh, use their unique abilities to solve various puzzles in a, a wild, ro wild rooster super game. Well, uh, you're asking if there's, a, if there's a connected lore also in the subtext. Uh, first, the answer right? is yes. Uh, there is, uh, all the worlds are connected with, uh, with a, uh, oh. No, no, yeah, if you're, you're safe once you get a bone, it's, uh, it's good. Just like in real life. <laughs> all right, I've got a lot of coins here. Uh, this is good. Let's see if I can find a shop now. No guarantees. Uh, oh. oh, these things are dangerous. These are sort of uh, explosive blocks that will like, well, actually, don't want to hit that one. Oh, that's bad. 
Alright, let's stop. Let's go in. Let's be safe. Uh, even the, these earlier levels right now, even still, uh, if I wasn't talking, I could probably play without too much danger, but as long as I can think about it. Oh, oh, there's World 3. Uh, no, it's a, it's a green bone. Green bone. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, it scares them away, right? They're, they're they gotta feel something. No, yeah, barking does nothing. Uh, barking is just sort of a. I figured you couldn't have a dog game without barking. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> That's what the barking is, yeah. Let me start at World 2. So you might have said this and I missed it. Um, mm -hmm. Are Is this, what what stage in development is this? Done? Still in progress? Done. Totally. Uh, yeah. Uh, trying to keep the game pretty small. Um, I'm looking right now at adding bosses and talking to Matt about scoring some new music um, for that. Uh, trying to find a way of rounding it out, um, uh, but I don't know. It's sort of one of those like we'll see. I was like, oh, I could probably get this out in early 2018, uh, um, but I guess we'll see. So there's a certain level of uh, it's just taken so long to build. Um, right now, I've been like doing like Steam integration and platform stuff with iPhone. Um, I'm ready to kind of just uh, ship it and be done, uh, just because of just how long it's taken. Um, even though it's not a, an enormous game, um, uh, also I, I guess I like small projects too. It's fun to uh, to make little things. So yeah, I think it'll probably come out uh, early next year. Fingers crossed. Oh, through uh, the, the spikes? No. That was dangerous. Oh. Oh, those are rocks. Yeah. The yeah. These are these are not gonna let me through. Stained glass windows. Stained glass. Uh, stained glass uh, block rocks. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, Randy. Hi, it's me again. <clears throat> um, it's kind of interesting how there's like the like as the more I watch it, the more comparisons to Spelunky emerge, and some of it's kind of obvious, like warp at the beginning or and know, the dying, the bats or whatever. But there's Ooh. some kind of like subtler ones too about like how the game is played or what the player is supposed to be paying attention to. Kind of like how that one type of enemy is like just an eyeball that you can kind of start to notice and then you get, you kind of like, you get the hang of looking out for him and stuff like that. Like how spelunky horny were you when you made this or it just... I guess a lot, yeah. Um, I mean, it was never the initial goal, but I definitely think, uh, think a lot about the game. Um, uh, the... Uh, yeah, it's definitely hard to say. Yeah. I'm trying to think how much, how much spelunky on purpose uh, I don't know I think I was really interested in a game where I could uh, build and like or have something that I could uh, just really kind of dig through the whole environment with like freedom uh, to kind of move through and it's like tunneling create you know creatively seemed uh, seemed fun but also a somewhat difficult uh, design problem to work with because it's like you can often get yourself into situations where you're stuck uh, as a player um, because you basically dug up everything or you've uh, you've created spaces that are like unwinnable uh, so um, that's where I'm relying a lot on gravity as you dig down um, to uh, I didn't make the levels too wide I think they're all about uh, they're 30 tiles wide so that uh, you don't uh, it won't it won't generate things that are um, probably impossible um, and that's definitely no player wants to have a level where they're like oh well now I can't do anything um, or I can't backtrack um, um, you're really limited um, to be able to go up, even more so than uh, than Spelunky. There's no ropes or way to to really climb right now. Um, so because gravity and uh, the, the destructive nature of the game, um, as you go deeper, um, and it's a platformer, um, yeah. So other 
others flunky things. Uh, I, I don't know. It's looking for kind of simple, basic enemies. Um, uh, the bat is, uh, I think, the most spelunky-esque kind of character. But let's see. Where am I supposed to go? Over here. Looking for that bone. Another question for you. Um, can you recommend any uh, resources for uh, game developers interested in accessibility? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I'm got. I've got something I was working together for a talk on, um, and I'm probably turning that into a blog post that I'll uh, post soon. Um, in terms of uh, the stuff that I have, uh, um, I would recommend uh, probably at first just Googling Natlink and Dragonfly in association with um, uh, uh, Dragon Natural Speaking. Uh, particularly, oh shoot, now I'm in trouble. Uh, the Windows program. Um, uh, the Windows one is very different from the Mac version. Um, um, it's both good, um, but also um, uh, Hackable, um, thanks to I think some people at um, uh, old old people at uh, Nuance who um, added the kind of original Python hooks that people are still using to inject code with. Um, so yeah, I would search for Natlink and uh, Dragonfly um, and just voice coding. Um, but I should have some stuff up pretty soon. Um, and just as an addendum to my question, I'm going to shamelessly plug a friend of mine, Adrian Kuzminski, out of school, is uh, kind of starting, seems to be starting a small business around consulting with game designers on uh, site accessibility. Oh, cool. Okay, so a couple of the things that you're, I'm seeing the dog do, I'm wondering if you have names for them. Uh, one of them is the move where the dog turns white and busts sideways. And then the behavior of the dog, when it gets the bone, it kind of uh, freaks out and destroys everything. What do you call those things? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's uh, this is a dash. Uh, the white is sort of symbolizing uh, whether or not you actually have uh, a dash available to you. So it inverts um, when you dash and when you land again um, you're able to uh, dash so you have like one dash in the air uh, the um, if you actually break some blocks you can actually continue the dash um, actually I should probably try and create some aqueducts for um, being let's see uh, this is gonna be hard oh this is really hard now I can make them. Uh, the uh, let's see. I can actually try to create. Yeah. Do a dash here, and then I can chain a dash. You can actually chain dashes in air if you're breaking environments, um, which actually makes you go faster too. Uh, um, oh, actually, I should bring up some other stuff. Um, forgot that I had some uh, good puzzle stuff I was starting to work on. Um, let's see, bring up Xcode. Um, so I use a lot of tiled um, in DigDog. Um, even though it's all procedurally generated, um, a lot of the rooms are built um, with uh, tiled levels. Bring up some of the obstacles in World 1 or World 2. Uh, so this is uh, Tiled, which is a Tiled editor. I like it because it works um, well on both Mac and Windows. Um, and let me zoom in on these guys. So these are pretty sim Oops, that's too much zoom. 300? Yeah, that's good. Uh, so these are all sort of rooms um, uh, that, get, that get placed um, into levels. Um, they sort of uh, get layered on top of it. This is from the Desert World, uh, so from the second one. Um, and uh, all these blocks um, will get added or maybe added um, 
this is uh, actually more, I guess, Spelunky inspiration is looking at the source code on there. You can actually just, uh, the original Spelunky was uh, just online. You could just dig through the source, and it was uh, it's kind of fun to see how they um, layered in uh, obstacles into their world. Um, and I was using that as uh, ways for, or just, I guess, it's, yeah, following a similar suit. Um, all these black blocks in this, oh, these are, uh, I should say, these, uh, these are divided into um, white, red, white, red. Um, uh, these are all just individual rooms, and the red and the white just break up. Um, for me, visually knowing like which ones are different rooms, if I have just one map that I can edit on, um, I'm able to uh, uh, build a, a lot of levels um, fairly quickly. Um, and then just kind of uh, really easily see all the different pieces um, that I have. So there's like maybe like 64 different rooms or so combinations here. Um, but here's a, here's a cave that gets layered on. Um, these uh, blue blocks are maybe blocks, so they have like a percentage chance of actually spawning. Um, here's another one, just small little spike trap. Uh, these are just forcing empty blocks. So um, here's another one right here with these empty blocks. So that just creates a, a trap for you to be able to fall on and, uh, or enemies to fall and die on too. Um, so this is all built and tiled. Um, bring up another one. Uh, more open blocks. Uh, this is more World 3 where I was actually trying to create like more open spaces. And so um, the generation takes uh, um, kind of the worlds that, that are built out and then we'll like layer some of these on, um, the shop being one of them. But um, there's just more combinations of things that can get layered on. I don't remember what S stands for or something. S stands for something. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, some of the tool set. Um, yeah. Great. Well, let's give it up for Rusty. <laughs> and Dig Dug. <laughs>